Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, June 17th, 2021, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, uh, I just first off, I want to uh, thank everybody for wishing me well with my 2000th subscriber. Um, of course, I couldn't have made it here without any of you. So I want to thank everybody for being uh, so patient with me and trying to get my message out here, a very different message than what you might hear anywhere else. So it's been a, a, a difficult, uh, hard-earned 2,000 subscribers. Of course, if I just went along with the program, I probably would have a lot more. But, you know, I'm fighting the grain on both sides. So like I frequently say, I'm like a, you know, Oreo cookie. I'm the stuffing in an Oreo cookie being squeezed from above and below. You know, whether it's mainstream or alternative, you know, nobody wants to look at things quite the way I do. But I'm going to still put out what I believe to be the truth or something close to it on my channel. And including in this video here, and um, I decided to do this one on this out of place artifact because... I really do think I know what it is, and it's been long speculated about. If you don't know about it, perhaps you don't, but I think a lot of people will be familiar with this artifact, this out-of-place artifact. It's the Lake Winnipesaukee Mystery Stone, as they call it, and um, it's a very interesting artifact, out-of-place artifact. We're going to learn about it in this video here. But what I think is going on with this thing is that it's being sort of over-analyzed and overthought about. And just the speculation runs rampant in any direction. And the more kookier and crazier that it gets or whatever, the more that people like about it whereas you know i'm going to propose something here that sounds more rational um from a more anthropological and scientific point of view and of course depending upon if you concur with some of the research that i've already done on this channel so you may have to have seen some of these other things to sort of understand more in the line of thought that I'm going with here. But we're going to talk about it. We're going to read about it and talk about it. It certainly is a very interesting artifact. So, you know, without having to look at the Wikipedia article here, which neglects to mention some things, by the way, about this song, which I find very curious. And why would that be, including this one from Ancient Origins, which really doesn't have anything to add to the story or anything like that. But it's of major interest to me, I mean, besides the fact that it's right in the heart of Stonewall territory. Here's Lake Winnipesaukee right here in New Hampshire, and I frequently show this LIDAR mapper tool that the state of New Hampshire provides um, to the public here what they call the Stonewall Mapper, and all these sort of pink things appearing around here are areas of concentrations of stone walls that have been somewhat verified. They're not completely, they're, they're, they're verified through satellite imagery at this stage, but they, are, they have to be verified on the ground, and there are some areas that they have they verified beside the satellite imagery and the thing is about the stone walls of new england if you don't know you're a new subscriber you don't know about my research especially my hands-on research in the field research on the stone walls is that this is the largest mega city that ever existed on the face of the planet and that's what the stone walls represent besides a very high level of organization 
specific to the tasks that they were trying to do in these societies in the past. And if anybody can provide some answers, it would be the peoples, the native peoples from these areas, which would be the Iroquois and related peoples and other peoples in these areas. But as you know from the videos on this channel that I've covered, um, some of the interesting histories on these people, the Iroquois, I go over in this, this video here about how I propose that the Iroquois are really the hope well, the hope well that were loyal to the Adena because their great law of peace was passed down to them by the quote unquote big man, the great peacemaker um, from their ancient past. And they don't know when that was exactly. And he just happens to be a big man, but not just figuratively, but literally, and probably one of these Adena, as they know well about. It's not like it's a mystery to mainstream and trying to hide it from us or anything. It's Adena people of unusual stature with high vaulted craniums, and we're not really human beings in any sense at all. We're just different type of humanoid type creature that you know, may share some level of compatibility with us, evidently. So, what is this artifact um, exactly? And many things have been proposed about it, but I think, I believe I could almost with certainty say what it is. But... There's really nothing new to cover in the Ancient Origins, although this was updated in uh, 2020, 19th of June, just recently this updated. So, happened to come on my radar all of a sudden without even knowing this, but I had certain things saved in my, uh, my bookmarks, and one of these things had to do with this, but... Looking into it further, I can really say, you know, with certainty what I believe it to be, I think is the closest thing to reality. See, the only thing that they're adding to this at all was some recent sort of postulations by somebody. And it's, they talk about the uh, uh, New England... Uh, New Hampshire Historical Society and where this thing is housed. And we're going to read from that because that is really the best article on it. But I want to just read about what they say about some of the new sort of speculation on it. Okay, so is the Mystery Stone a Native American birthstone? Indigenous historian Joe Graveling suggested an interesting purpose for the mystery stone. He told Greenfield Recorder in 2018 that he believes it was a Native American birthstone. According to the Greenfield Recorder, a birthstone is a stone that was heated and internally placed inside the pregnant woman by midwives to relax muscles during difficult births. Blade Line says this particular stone would have been extra special and used by a Native American midwife to help her mother deliver a person who became a venerated spiritual or government leader of either sex. He also believes that it was a grave offering, and if the construction workers had dug a little deeper, they would have encountered bones. Okay, so this is just complete speculation on the part of this person, and of course, they're just will say anything that seems reasonable to them, but to me, it doesn't sound reasonable at all because of the things that are carved into it, they're decorations that are carved into it, the symbols that are carved into it, um, wouldn't be fit for this kind of thing to put inside some woman or whatever with these things, in, you know, it chiseled out of the sides of it. I don't think so, okay? Unless it was uh, none of one of these votive things, which I don't believe it was, okay? And so this is the only thing thing that this ancient origins article which is pretty standard fare not much different than a wikipedia article although they add this thing here and some other speculation about it whatever but i want to read from the new hampshire historical society website here where the thing is housed here 
And I think it's the best article of all because it mentions a couple of things that these articles did not mention, the Wikipedia article and the Ancient Origins article. So let's read this here because I think this is the best one. The mystery of the mystery stone. The so-called mystery stone has puzzled scholars for nearly 150 years. Discovered in 1872, the stone has no known history prior to that date. At just under 4 inches tall and 2.5 inches in diameter, its physical characteristics are a study in contradictions. Figures carved by advanced technology in a type of stone not found in New Hampshire. Is it an ancient Indian artifact, a geological oddity, an exercise in symbology, a clever hoax? The history of the mystery. So this is what the historical society is saying about it. They really don't know what it is, and they're happy to keep on postulating about it. I don't know, and see, very distrusting of any sort of official stuff like the Humboldt Museum with the Lovelock people, with their nonsense, you know, slightly larger. But in any case, <clears throat> who's to say exactly what it is, but a lot of speculation on it as included what we just heard in ancient origins there but again i'm gonna tell you what it is and you know I, just to pat myself on the back and i'll have to my old subscribers have to excuse me because i do this once in a while just i guess maybe i come across as sort of like uh sort of average intelligence, you know, New Yorker guy with a heavy Brooklyn accent or something like that, and uh, sort of rather crude sometimes maybe, but, you know, I'm a rather intelligent guy. I'm kind of smarter than the average bear, if I could use a yogi bear expression there, and, <clears throat> you know, I it was in grade school that because I was such a proficient reader, that the teachers in that school wanted to make me an adjunct teacher for students that had trouble reading. And I did that for a while in grade school. But, you know, of course, I had to give up my playtime, which I didn't want to do too much. So it didn't last very long. But they asked me to do that in, uh, in junior high school by way of, uh, you know, the way American schools are, you know, segmented junior high school I, I i they had a specialized advanced curriculum set up for me in, in junior high school so i didn't even attend regular class i spent most of my time in the library reading shakespeare and doing advanced mathematics and things like that and then in high school i just i did not go into school at all i just told the teachers look Give me the textbooks and I'll come in and take the test when it comes time to take the test. Otherwise, I'm not attending class. And then basically I stayed home and memorized the chapters, you know, one by one until I had them all committed to memory and, you know, in my own time. And then I came into school and took the test. You couldn't kick out the, one of the best students in the school. Of course, you know, they need the grades for, you know, their funding and et cetera, et cetera. So you're not going to kick one of the best students in school out of school for attendance problems. But, you know, I had to make up for it in the end anyway. But, and in college, I was uh, dean's list and honors list. And, you know, in my IQ test, I scored very high, almost genius level, et cetera, et cetera. So, look, uh, you know, just to pat myself on the back a little bit before I die here, you know, I'm 60 years old. I don't know, you know, maybe I got a good 20 years left or something. I don't expect to live beyond average life expectations. So, you know, why not toot my horn a little bit? I'm a pretty intelligent guy and I can figure things out rather quickly. And I think they're overanalyzing this thing and this is what the problem is. And, you know, to for New Hampshire's benefit here, they just keep it a mystery and it's always going to, you know, grab the attention of people. But I think I know precisely what it is. So let's 
keep reading here now that I've uh, broken my arm, patting myself on the back to tell you a little bit about myself. But <clears throat> let's uh, let's read this article here because it's very, very good. The history of the mystery. In early June 1872, workmen found a suspicious lump of clay while digging a post hole in Mer Meredith Village at the point where Lake Wakawan originally emptied into Lake Winnipesaukee near a spot known locally as Hodgson's Mill. The workmen gave it to a financier, Seneca A. Ladd, a local collector of minerals and relics. Some accounts claim the lamb was Ladd's and he had hired the workmen himself. Others relate that Ladd just happened to be passing by when the clay lump was found and he rescued it from the dirt pile. Hmm. Rather nebulous story there. I don't know what they're getting at here, but I mean, the clay lump of clay was left out of the other things, okay? So if it was found in a lump of clay, you know, what time period are we really talking about? Regardless of how the stone came to be in his possession, when Ladd cleaned off the clay casing, he discovered an intriguing egg-shaped stone with nine carvings depicting a face, a teepee, an ear of corn, along with strange geometric designs. The stone also had a hole bored through it from both ends, a hole later found to be made with different sized drill bits. A geological study of the stone conducted in the 1990s found it to be made of quartzite or myelinite, a, min a material not known to be otherwise present in New Hampshire. It is perfectly shaped and unblemished by any distortions or markings other than the pictogram carving. So, where there's a lot of quartz in the mountainous area there, like Y quartz up by Jimmy over there, it's not this quartz site. You know, that's not to be found in these areas, especially there in, I guess, in New Hampshire. So that's why it's out of place artifact. It's one of the reasons why it is, besides what it is in its entirety. But the stone remained in the possession of Ladd, a well-known and prosperous businessman in the Lakes region for several decades and was then passed down to his family. Born in 1819 in Luton, New Hampshire, Ladd trained as a carriage maker before finding success as a manufacturer of pianos and melodeons. In 1869, he founded Meredith Village Savings Bank in an effort to encourage factory workers to save their money. The bank was housed in a large building on Main Street in Meredith. It is the current home of the Meredith Historical Society, and Ladd filled the bank's reception area with artifacts from his own collection of geological specimens. He had already established a reputation as a general gentleman scientist, a quote-unquote gentleman scientist, a breed of amateur scholars who, were devo who devoted their energy, talents, and fortunes to the pursuit of academic hobbies. The bank thus became a cabinet of curiosities, and Ladd added the mysterious stone to the collection. This was going on with a lot of wealthy men, gentlemen, back in those time periods. People who had money, who were interested in these things, who were going to go off and pursue these things, often very amateurishly, and in other times, you know, in more scientific methods. But we heard about that, about uh, Harold S. Gladwin down there in uh, Arizona with the Snake Town people there, and the first guy to open any sort of museum down there in, in Arizona. But... He was uh, pro proposed some theories about some anomalous type of peoples with a different morphology that lived there, and was, you know, immediately, um, you know, ridiculed. Here's the train. The freight train. <clears throat> The stone quickly gained public attention with the New Hampshire Patriot and State Gazette, the leading newspaper in the Granite State at the time, running a piece on July 17, 1872, announcing the stone's discovery. Even before that, the stone had caught the attention of amateur scientist and inventor Daniel J. Tapley of Danvers, Massachusetts. Tapley delivered a lecture on the stone for the Essex Institute in Middleton. 
Massachusetts within two short weeks of the stone's discovery. He further publicized the stone by writing an article about it for the journal The American Naturalist, published in November that same year. Anthropology, quote unquote, The Amateur Naturalist, Volume 6, Number 11, November 1872, Topley dubbed it, quote, a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable Indian relic unquote, and relate how he had serendipitously come across the, quote, object of scientific interest, unquote, while on a fishing excursion to Meredith the week after the stone had been found. He made no mention that he likely already knew Lad. Tapley's older brother also lived in Meredith, and the men were in at least one local club together. So, you know, they knew each other through these means. It's nothing terribly exciting there with that, but they knew each other that way, and that's how they found out about it. With such publicity, the word word of the stone reached far and wide, even to European scientists who could not discern any more about the stone's history than their American counterparts. In succeeding years, newspaper stories about the stone popped up at random intervals, with reporters claiming it had quote, attracted the wonder of the scientific world, unquote. In 1895, the Manchester Union reported that, quote, the strange relic has attracted much attention, unquote, even from the likes of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. A geological survey conducted by the state of New Hampshire in 1994 failed to shed much light on the stone either. And to this day, amateur and professional archaeologists have speculated about the mystery, mystery stone's origins. Okay, so the stone's origins and its purpose are two different things. But maybe we can speculate on one and be more certain of the other. But we're going to talk about that a little bit too at the end of this. The stone remained on display at Meredith Savings Bank for many years, even after Ladd's death in 1892. In 1927, his daughter, Frances Ladd Coe of Center Harbor, New Hampshire, donated the stone to New Hampshire to the New Hampshire Historical Society. Periodically on display at the society, the Mystery Stone annually solicits more inqu inquiries and interest than any other item in the society's vast collections. What is the Mystery Stone? So here's the what. The most prevalent explanation has been that the that the Mystery Stone is a prehistoric Native American artifact. This discovery of an unusual Indian relic was not un unprecedented at the time. Encouraged by a highly romanticized view of America's Native heritage developed in the mid-19th century, especially in the East where fears of Anglo-Indian conflict were generations in the past. An increasing reverence for the power of nature combined with nostalgia for pre-industrial America combined to elevate Native Americans to the role of quote-unquote noble savages for many Americans. <clears throat> Indians' perceived ability to commune with a pristine and unspoiled environment lent an air of mystery to the natural world, suggesting that natives could somehow unlock the secrets of the universe in a way that quote-unquote civilized men and women were no longer able to do, bound as they were by an over-reliance on logic and reason and wholly cut off from their more intuitive and emotional natures by the standards of society. New Hampshire already boasted one such natural wonder which had only been discovered a few decades earlier, the Old Man of the Mountain. First identified in 1803 by workers carving a path through Franconia Notch, the Old Man had become a major tourist attraction by the middle of the 19th century. It was also a source of controversy. Had the Indians fashioned it as a harbinger of some sort of prophecy, or was it naturally occurring? geological formation. Artists began to feature, began featuring it in their paintings of the White Mountains, and author Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a short story in 1850 about it entitled The Great Stone Face. If it has it has remained a source of public fascination ever since. And you know, this great stone face could be related to this artifact, no doubt, in a culture that was a lot bigger and wider than we can possibly imagine. And, you know, one of the things that made it so interesting to me was that this artifact was taken from right in the midst of Stonewall country. And here you can see Lake Winnipesaukee here amongst the stone walls. 
okay at least these ones have been verified there's tons of unverified ones in there and ones that have been cannibalized removed so we can't even get a clear picture of what this looks like completely but if i back away here this is the area that was found and these areas here i think are with the confirmed areas of stone walls on the ground and by satellite as well but <clears throat> if we move over here a little bit you can see it's surrounded by these stone wall areas <clears throat> that you know Jim Vieira and I think go back many thousands of years and when you get closer as you notice over here to the Connecticut River the density of the stone walls increase okay because one of the reasons is because the Connecticut River was one of those ancient highways of the past and from what we know of the Iroquois or any peoples that might have lived in any sort of organized society in the mountainous regions and in the New York area, including the Flat Plains area of the West and along the St. Lawrence, etc., were highly organized people. This, you know, whoever built the stone walls obviously were highly organized. Okay, so keep that in mind when you have to look at these things he was looking at these things from a different eye okay these anthropological people and and archaeological people look at it from perspectives that already laid out for them so they have preconceived notions about these things they're not looking at it with the sort of open mind that i feel that they should be looking at it. and other specialties should be looking at these things as well Okay, people who are not particularly well versed in archaeology or anthropology per se, but in other sort of, you know, professions and uh, disciplines, you know, to get the, sort of their takes on it, like the architect, a professor of architecture from Texas who looked at the uh, Rio Beck style Mayan buildings there and was saying, hmm, something funny about these, you know, so... You know, they don't like that, though. Everything has to be in a neat package. So this artifact was found around Lake Winnipesaukee here. Here it is in the midst of Stonewall country here. Just keep that in mind. All right. So back to this article here. In the Midwest, people explored the earthen mounds of the ancient Native American civilization with similar awe and bewilderment. Well into the 20th century, all sorts of remnants of Native culture, axe head bowls, tools, ceremonial pieces, fossilized human remains turned up across the American continent. The anomaly of the stone's possible machine-made carvings and the fact that it was composed of a rock type not found in New Hampshire could not be so easily explained away, though, and do not support the idea that the stone is of Native American origin, nor does the Native culture depicted on the stone bear any great resemblance to the Abenaki, which were New Hampshire's Native peoples. The face on the stone has been likened more to Eskimo or Aztec, and the TP depicted on the stone was a type more commonly used by Natives in the American West. Some mystery stone enthusiasts have suggested that the stone has spiritual spiritual significance for prehistoric native culture that have once covered most of North America. Hence, the stone may depict the forging of a treaty between two different tribes, or it may have been part of the ritual that accompanied a water burial for a native figure of importance some distance from New Hampshire. Over the years, with the stone's provenance in doubt, other theories as to its origin have been posited. For example, in 1931, a letter writer suggested to the president of the New Hampshire Historical Society that the mystery stone was actually a thunderstone, the most perfectly worked thunderstone ever discovered. New Hampshire, uh, thunderstones are reputedly rocks that fall from the sky during lightning storms. Another freight train. Get him a lot of here. Towing something heavy.
Thunderstorms are reputedly rocks that fall from the sky during lightning storms. Another more recent theory <clears throat> argues that it's a lodestone used for navigational purposes in the 16th century as an alternative to a compass. Still, other theories link the mystery stone to numerology, aliens, massive planetary shifts, or a worldwide apocalypse. Of course, there is also the possibility that the mystery stone was a hoax, perpetrated possibly by Seneca Ladd himself, since Ladd never made any money off the stone and garnered little fame for his association with it, the motivation for concocting such a hoax remains unclear. The one thing that most mystery stone interpreters can agree on that it is an out of place artifact, meaning it should not have been discovered where it was. The mystery continues. And here they show some of the other artifacts that this fellow uh, lad here gathered here. Some of these other stones who looks like to me to be like amulets with these holes drilled through them. But what's interesting about this one, it has a smaller hole going through it on one side and a bigger one on the other, sort of indicating to me how it was fastened to whatever it was. Okay, so one of the things that's postulated by it is that there was a wire in it that held it to something. Okay, as it's, I believe it says here in this ancient origins, the perfectly drilled hole. So we're going to read from this a little bit. The one particularly interesting detail about the mystery stone's construction worth noting are the two holes bored in both ends of the stone with different sized bits. Each bore is straight, not tapered. Scratches in the lower bore suggest it was placed on a metal shaft and removed several times. According to one analysis done by New Hampshire state officials in 1994, Richard Bosford, a state archaeologist, believes these holes are highly regular. I've seen a number of holes bored in stone with technology that you would, as you would associate with pre prehistoric North America. There's a certain amount of uneven unevenness and this hole was extremely regular throughout. What we did not see was variations that would be consistent with something that was several hundred years old. Rosford, who deeply laments the lack of details on the context of which this stone was found, went on to suggest that the holes were drilled using power tools rather than traditional techniques used by Native Americans. He added that there was every chance the holes were made during the 19th century, which would mean tampering of the object. This has led some to believe Winnipesaukee stone mystery is simply some kind of elaborate hoax. Okay, so it's so unbelievable that, you know, it has to be a hoax. And here's the face of it, right? So let me propose this to you. Let's say it's not the face of any of these Inuit people or, you know, Celts or whoever it is. And it's more likely the face of the Adena. Okay. That's what they're missing from this. And it's only four inches, remember that. The only thing that seems certain or which of there is consensus is that it was created using some type of machine. However, the fact remains that no one knows who made the object, when or why. At one time, the mystery stone attracted the wonder of the scientific world with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., offering to send a map of Seneca a, map to Seneca a. Lad to make a casting of the ed, egg. Today, the Lake Winnemusaukee Mystery Stone is on display in a case at the Museum of New Hampshire's his, History, surrounded by mirrors to show off its unique and enigmatic features. So, I, as I said, this article more or less said all the standard things about it, you know, where it came from, who found it. It's a mystery. Here's some of the close-ups of some of the markings on this stone. Okay, so... I think I know what it is, and it has a lot to do. Let's suppose it is in some sort of, it is some sort of ancient artifact from the way distant past, okay? That was machined by some people in the way distant past, okay? What is it?
Okay, and I, you know, it seems kind of odd to me that all these people would speculate about these things, but something that they missed that I thought would be more appropriate for it, being that there's this hole drill for it, one size bigger than the other, that it was held on some metal bar or something like that, rod or something like that. I mean, nobody ever proposed that this thing may be some sort of symbol of authority. And the sort of the corn cob on it suggests this because corn represents this power in this society. If we know anything from the Iroquois, and I told you this story that I got from the professor who is a native person herself, okay, Tuscarawan professor from Cornell University, who believed that the Iroquois migrated from the Ohio Valley, which just so happens to where the Odina and Hopewell were in the past, okay. And we saw some of the artifacts, some of the Adena tablets, and some of the copper work of the supposed Hopewell, who are not separate from the Adena, as we know from the University of Indiana, okay? That uh, this artifact might have followed the Hopewell into the area, who are really the Iroquois. The Iroquois are really the Hopewell, okay? At least the factions that were loyal to the Adena, and quite possibly how they were working this very complex system and showing a high level of organization like we know all about the Iroquois from their great, great law of peace, the way their society was organized, their ability to grow all sorts of things, okay, one of them being maize. They had 500 acre farms along the St. Lawrence River that George Washington sent agents up there to burn because they were supplying the British with food. 500 acre farms without machinery, by the way, okay. Some of these towns, as reported in Charles C. Mann's books, uh, their village areas were surrounded by square miles of maize, okay, so you're moving this much product, obviously you're growing it for your population, which could conceivably be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, okay, very systematically distributing among these people in the stone wall areas, which I feel represent some of this organization of the past, okay, it seems highly likely to me that these things are symbol, this thing is a symbol of authority, okay? This was a symbol of a commission given to somebody who was an authority, an official from the tribal government sent down into these areas. This thing was more like a scepter, okay? Symbols of authority, okay? Sovereign symbols of sovereignty. Okay, these are what all these things are as we relate to various things of the past. Ceremonial mace, okay, we know what this is, okay, this is a symbol of authority, symbol, sovereign objects of authority, okay, Subject, you know, sovereign objects of official, okay, commissions, okay, commissions, artifact commission artifacts like commissioned by kings to show that you were commissioned by somebody and, and this is what this thing represents i'm almost certain of it okay with almost 100 percent certainty that this thing was probably mounted on the end of a metal rod or staff or some sort like a, a like a a uh, mace or uh you know, one of these scepters, you know, this is what it's like. And this is, the symbols on it represent the authority, okay? The symbol of the corn represents the power. And the other symbols on it just simply represent the group or unit that the person was officialing for, okay? That's what this is. I'm almost certain of it. It's a symbol of authority, a symbol of commission given to some figure of authority in this highly organized society of the ancient past that clearly this mega city represents with these walled areas everywhere here that don't make any sense in the settler and colonists in remote regions where everybody in the areas know nobody's ever lived including the native peoples have never lived there there's no reason to live there okay but to do all sorts of things required in a large society the moving of material was 
one of the highest priorities in this society. It was certainly among the Iroquois, okay? And as I say, these Iroquois were most likely the Hopewell. According to this lady, professor from, from uh, Cornell, who says they probably migrated from the Ohio Valley, Okay, it's most likely the Hopewell, and this is one of the artifacts they brought with them. But as many artifacts, pendants, and other things, they here's some of the other things that were collected with symbols on them, all symbols of authority. See, nobody postulates this. It's eggs or for helping birthing, and also it's just any more crazy ideas to attract attention to it. Okay, but they're overanalyzing and overthinking this thing. I'm telling you, that's what this represents. Okay, this man, this is a symbol of authority, a symbol of a commission, and the other symbols represent the level of commission this is, what group it belonged to, the symbols of this group, the particulars of this group. So everybody would know that this is the symbol of authority that gave the commissioner. Whoever held this scepter, okay, the authority, you know, so, and as I said, these are a highly organized society with large numbers of material moving through these areas. These stone walls, let's say they even you don't believe the whole, you know, any alternative story about the stone walls and just represented settlers or whatever. So we'll imagine what would have to take place, even if it was settlers and colonists or whatever, the type of materials and goods would have to move on a daily basis, including wood, timber, you know, that had to be used for fuel. With summer, you know, winter, fall, all seasons used for fuel, for cooking and other purposes, constantly, all the time, for what we understand from Charles C. Mann's book, much larger number of people living in these areas. If the stone walls represent anything, it represents that. The 240,000 miles just in the United States, northeastern part of the United States, doesn't include Canada and everywhere else. Okay, it's like 500,000 miles. That would take 15,000 men, like over 2,000 years to build all the stone walls. So it's ridiculous, all their notions about it and everything. So I'm telling you this, folks, okay, based on how I can perceive this okay and what i know i don't have to overanalyze or overthink it okay simply a uh, symbol of authority these things and the symbols on it represent the particulars of it okay if you held this thing you were immediately recognized as an authority figure you know from the main council probably somebody would come and oversee and check on the things that were going on in these areas. This is how high a level of organization the the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee, as their real name is, okay, as their phony name, phony French name, the Iroquois, okay, it's clear as day their level of organization, okay, you cannot grow a lot of things in the mountainous regions, you just can't. If you're supporting a lot of people, you can't grow a lot of stuff there and you have to get it from somewhere else that's why the confederation is a cooperative between five tribes six tribes the iroquois the haudenosaunee okay high level of organization with all these food material moving throughout this whole society here in a very highly organized way not willy-nilly not people running up and grabbing stuff and you know this is what our impression of if you know, look at the past and the way that you know our history teaches how primitive these people were well they weren't primitive they were highly sophisticated the further back in time you go when these stone walls were built for example by these giant hominids or humanoid beings as jim Vieira and i think all right and this is the face of the adena my friends it's not the Inuit or anybody from Europe or anything like that. This is the face of the Adena. This is an artifact that probably came from the Adena. And who knows how old the Adena were and where they came from. Okay? And all these artifacts came with them, along with it, and how to use them. Okay? This is something that would be used by the next official and the next official and the next for a thousand years. Okay? A hard stone that was not easy to damage and very hard to, um, you know, alter in any way, okay? The corn is a symbol of power. 
the food power and the symbol of organization of the distribution distribution of maize among these people in all the areas they live with. We already know from hunters and everybody, if there were hundreds of thousands of people living in the mountainous regions, how fast the game in the area would disappear until there were none. Okay, they weren't eating the game. It was impossible, just impossible. According to Charles C. Mann, with all the numbers, high numbers of people living in these areas and not the low numbers of thought, of, you know, originally by the, you know, researchers in the past. We're talking about theories from the 1800s and before that, you know, when they didn't understand a lot of stuff, but they're still accepted today and ingrained in our perception of these peoples of the past. Okay, so listen, guys, this is what it is. All right. I don't care what any of these people say. It's clear as day to me that this little four-inch thing was mounted on top of a scepter-type wand or something like that. Wands are very common among Native peoples in the Americas and whatnot, and this was attached to one. It's a symbol of authority. You understand? It's not any of the things that they say it is, right? It's clear as day to me that it's a symbol of authority, okay? Everything on it smacks of it. The face, the corn, the other symbols, okay, all tell what this person was and what his position was and what his authority was and what gives him the authority, okay? Why nobody speculated this, you know, especially of the mainstream academics, really is beyond me, okay? And it's clear that it has a teepee on it. Well, it's not native, in, you know, to this area. What's a teepee? Well, you know, it's associated with, you know, all the plains in these, but the plains in these just west of the Ohio Valley. Okay, and if the Hopewell, the Iroquois, and the Haudenosaunee are really the Hopewell that migrated from the Ohio Valley when the giants were destroyed and killed off by the uh, hostile to the Adena, okay, then these people carried it with them and took these things with them and the organization and all the um, great law of peace from the quote unquote big man from their legends, okay? So, look, folks, it's no mystery to me, okay? It seems very clear to me that this is a symbol of authority. Simple as that. Really, the corn is what clinches it for me. The face and the corn and the other symbols on it or other information on this thing that indicate the level of authority and what this rank of this person was and, you know, where they got their authority from, that they could just walk. A stranger in this huge society, you're going to go somewhere and be somebody who oversees things for the main council, wherever they are located, all right, and nobody knows you there, well, you're going to have, have to have something that's a symbol of authority, and this is what it is. You see, it came from somewhere else, okay? Why is it so such a mystery that you would find some artifact up here uh, from some other place in the country or even the world when we know all about the Hopewell trading network, okay? The Hopewell tradition and the trading network that goes back into prehistoric times, all the trails that I've gone over on this channel. Look, you put in peace all the things that I've gone over on this channel, folks. It's real clear and easy to see to me what was going on, what this thing is. It's real easy for me to see what this is. It's clear as day to me. This is a symbol of authority, part of a scepter or a wand that somebody carried with them, somebody of authority, an official, somebody appointed to do this task, okay, in a very highly organized society where vast mountains of material were moving around, timber and corn and beans and squash and furs and, you know, from the animals that they did harvest. But you notice how they managed everything, including not only the forest and their agriculture they managed, but they also managed all the game animals so they would never disappear. They weren't eating deer every night of the week, folks. They lay, ate a lot of things out of the sea, out of the water, learned how to smoke fish and salt fish and do all these kind of things. A lot of bounty of the sea and the waterways all over the place, including farming fish on their own. They were farming fish. Something that they don't tell, talk about or tell you about, but all the Native peoples knew how to do all these things. They kept rabbits, they kept wild turkeys, they did a lot of things, folks, that you never learned about in school. All right? This is a symbol of authority, folks, simple as that. Somebody commissioned to do a particular task for the main council, an overseer, 
Okay, this is their symbol of authority. Symbol of strategy came from somewhere else. Big deal. Okay, vast training networks and trails used as highways and including used as highways in our current manifestation of culture here in North America. We use them as highways. We just put asphalt down on top of it and now they're our highways, okay? Things came from all over North the Americas there into the Adena and Hopewell tradition there where they manufactured goods. All right, folks. So I look. This is what I think it is. That's I'm making this call, folks. I think it's the best one out of them all. All right, what they're telling you it is, it might be, and all this kind of stuff. It's a bunch of baloney. And if Klaus Stoner would listen to reason, yeah, and he seems like a reasonable guy, he might agree with me. I don't know, but I'm going to publish this on YouTube, so everybody's going to find out. This is what I call it. And uh, I think it's most reasonable explanation for it than anybody else has come up with based on my own research. All right, guys. Anyway, if you like the video, please do hit the like button. And if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe to the channel because I very interesting things are talked about on this channel and you might want to hear them. All right, guys. Anyway, Bugcat7. Signing off. Peace.